I think everybody can kind of feel with the inflation that's in the air these days. You know, I was there in 1971. I lived through it and I was, you know, in my late teens. So I didn't really understand that in July when I had a $20 bill, it had some level of backing of gold. And in September of that same 1971, it had just debt backing and it was now in the control of the central banks. I was too young to really understand that at that time, but having lived through it, I know what it smells like and tastes like and feels like and looks like. And these are all repeatable patterns. 100% we're at the very end. How does it impact the normal population, the general public? I think you are seeing this right now in the inflation that's raging. For them to say it's transitory is garbage because it hasn't been transitory since 1913 and it's not transitory now. There are too many things that are happening. Wages, what are you gonna do? Go in and cut wages? Mm, I don't think so. You know, all of the issues that we're seeing with the supply chains and globalization. And keep in mind in the 80s, when I first became a stockbroker, all the talk was about globalization. And I remember saying to myself, mm, not so sure that this is such a good thing for the normal person. Now, how that impacts markets, we have been taught that the only choices for investment are Wall Street products. So stocks, bonds, mutual funds, whatever. Here's the problem. You can only convert that wealth into, in this country, dollars. So if the dollar has no value and nobody will accept it, then what do you have? A trillion times zero is zero. And that's the piece that people miss. Baked into the very currency system is inflation because they knew governments could tax you without having to go through legislation. I mean, if you know that you're going to get higher taxes, you might complain, right? They don't want you to complain. They want you to comply. And for corporations, they want to be able to pay people less and less to work other than those that are chosen few. And so inflation causes that nominal confusion. So 1970, the average wage was about 9,500 bucks, but a family of four could live with one wage earner. Now, I'm not saying they were super wealthy, but they could get by. Today, I think the average wage is somewhere around, I don't know, 54, 58 grand. And on the outside, you'd go, well, pff, I'd much rather have 58,000 than 9,500, except that it takes two wage earners and your paycheck to paycheck at 100 grand. And everybody that made up to 150,000 got stimulus checks. What does that tell you? What do you think they want to be nice? It's because the currency is worth that much less. And that's also what's enabled that income and wealth inequality is the system that was put in place because they knew people wouldn't understand it. When you read the papers written by the bankers, by the IMF, by the BIS, by the Fed, by all these guys, right? You'll see that they actually admit to making things really complicated because if they do that, that people don't question them. I don't understand finances, so, uh, you know, gosh, they must be so much smarter than me. When I read them, number one, I know that what they're doing is they're giving a signal to those that have been deemed too big to fail to shift how they're positioned, but it is always the little guy. The institutional investors that are investing your money that have been picking up the slack so that you don't notice in the bond market how broken it is and how fragile it is. So that when it does implode, well, you know, those big guys have already gotten out. They're already putting their money in hard assets, gold, real estate, etc. And then the little guy is left holding the bag. And I do really feel strongly that you should always do what the smartest guys on any given topic are doing for themselves. So they're selling their stocks and they're buying hard assets. Hmm, it's so interesting. I came across an article, I think it was in the Financial Times, on the wealthy Chinese investors have stopped putting their money into real estate, which of course we know in China, there's problems around real estate, but instead they've been buying hard assets like Rolex watches and gold and things like that. 
When you're doing things like bullion, so maybe new eagles, things like that, you're looking at the spot market. Do you really think that Wall Street spot market that can create as much gold that does not exist as they want to and control for virtually no money, millions and billions and trillions of dollars in physical, do you think that really reflects its true fundamental value? No. So I do just a basic, easy calculation. Okay, what's the fundamental value? What's the true value of an ounce of gold for its most important function? And in my opinion, the most important function is to hold your wealth, your purchasing power even. It does many other things, but that's the most important function. So if I know for an absolute fact that the true value of an ounce of gold is $50,000, then quite honestly, I can spend, I haven't really spent 50,000 on a point, but I'm just saying, I do know that the minimum fundamental value of an ounce of gold is 50 grand. So if I spend anything less than that, and it's not even a high collectible, my bet is hedged. The people that buy the cryptocurrencies and the people that buy the gold have a very similar mindset. They're really unhappy with what they're seeing and they want a decentralized private place to hold wealth. I, I get that and I, I really do get that, but I don't think you're very private with Bitcoin because what do you do when you open an account? Don't you have to give them your name, address, social security number? It is decentralized except that it has to go over computer systems. So when we were uh, when we had gold and, and silver and it was in physical form, it was very heavy and inconvenient to carry that around. So you put it in a bank and they give you a gold certificate or a silver certificate, which you could go into any bank if you didn't like what the government was doing and you could convert it. So you had a decentralized money that was actually really private and it controlled the government because if you converted your gold certificates and took the gold out of the bank, well, then it created restrictions around how much spending the government could do. They didn't like that. So then they transitioned us into convenient paper money certificates because, hey, you can convert it into the gold and silver whenever you want. And look at how much lighter it is. Look at how much more convenient this is, right? And then in the 50s, they started with the credit cards, which had no, you didn't have to have any collateral. So it was a consumer credit card to get us used to that. I mean, we've been moving in this direction for a very long time, but at least if you're holding a dollar bill in your wallet, well, it is a debt instrument, Federal Reserve note, but it does not pay or charge interest. So you still have that privacy and even though you can't protect your purchasing power, you can protect your principal.